Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks again for joining us today. Uh, as I always ask, and there's always uh, a repeat offender, uh, <laughs> if you could please silence the cell phones uh, so we could avoid any interruptions. Um, my name is Muhammad Muhammad. I'm the executive director here at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. Uh, as always, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, and including everybody that's watching online, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know about a uh, exhibition that we have uh, on Wednesday. Uh, it's paintings and videos by uh, the artist Manal Deeb. Um, and the title of the exhibition is Heart Slash Homeless. Uh, it will be at from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. So if you can make it out, that would be... Uh, that would be nice. Uh, and there's more information at the front desk, uh, at the front table uh, with f flyers and cards. Uh, of course, it's a great honor to introduce uh, our distinguished speaker today, uh, Rachel uh, Beitari. Uh, I hope I said that uh, properly enough. Uh, and she'll be giving a talk uh, today titled how to say Auda in Hebrew, dismantling the fear of Palestinian return within Israeli society. Uh, so based, based in Tel Aviv, Zuchrot, which is uh, the organization that Rachel uh, is the director of, uh, it has focused since 2002 on the recognition of and responsibility for the Nakba uh, among the Israeli public. Uh, it's the only organization in Israel to focus on the right of return and because of that, it has stirred um, much controversy within Israeli communities. Uh, it contains one of the most extensive archives on the Nakba, including an online archive of all depopulated villages, their histories, uh, dates of demolition, and names of Israeli settlements that replace them, uh, as well as an archive of testimonies from Nakba survivors and other related uh, materials. Uh, and I, I'm sure Rachel will touch on this, but they have an actual app that you can download on your phone that will show you these um, depopulated villages. Uh, as the work of Zuchrot has developed and mention of the Nakba in Hebrew uh, became more acceptable, it has focused more on the right of return and presented a vision of a shared post-return decolonized uh, life in Palestine in a society where all inhabitants and returnees can live as equals in mutual respect. Um, a little bit about Rachel. Uh, she, um, so it will, before that, she will discuss Zohrot's vision, the challenges it faces, and its strategies for educating Jewish Israeli society. Uh, she will discuss why it is essential uh, to have this conversation in Hebrew as part of a process of de Zionization within Israeli society. So uh, again, uh, Rachel is the managing director of Zuchrot and a feminist political activist. She was born um, and raised in a Zionist family near the depopulated uh, Palestine, uh, Palestinian village of uh, Bashit, uh, of which she knew nothing growing up. Uh, Rachel earned her LLB from Tel Aviv University and worked as a journalist and editor for several uh, news organizations. Uh, she covered human rights, political and social issues in China as a Beijing-based reporter. And she also worked as media coordinator for the human rights uh, organization uh, Gisha, uh, focusing on Gaza. Uh, she lives in the occupied Palestinian town of Yaffa. Uh, after Rachel speaks, uh, we'll have our usual Q&A session. Uh, we ask that you, as always, wait for the mic to come to you so that also everybody online can hear you, um, can hear your question. Uh, and then for the online audience, you can always tweet your questions to our Twitter account, uh, which is at Palestine Center. Uh, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Rachel. She came here f all the way from Tel Aviv, so please give her a very warm welcome. Thanks so much, Muhammad. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm 
really can't tell you how honored I'm, I am to be here, um, and quite frankly, a little bit nervous too. Um, it's a huge privilege, so um, I first like to thank the Palestine Center and the Jerusalem Fund, uh, Mohammad, Rima, Samira, for uh, inviting me and for making it happening. Um, so as Muhammad said, uh, I'm the director of uh, uh, Zohrot, an organization, uh, the only organization that uh, is dedicated to commemoration and acknowledgement, taking responsibility for the Nakba within Israeli society, um, and growing support for the right of return within the society. Um, and we do that in a variety of ways through an education program, um, through publications like this one, um, through tours to uh, destroyed Palestinian villages and towns, through an annual film festival, exhibitions, um, our online archive, and much more. Maybe before we begin, I will just uh, like to show you, Mohammed also mentioned the app, so this is it. You can download it and install it on your own phones. It is called uh, I Nakba, though I like to dub it I Return. Um, and it has all the destroyed villages on an interactive GPS-based map um, that if you are in Palestine, you can follow uh, this map's instructions and get to destroyed villages. It's a quite unsettling experience to hear that you have reached your destination, but the destination is no longer there. Um, you can just open the app and see what was where you are and Im imagine what was there, and most importantly, imagine and envision the return to the same places. So please download it. It's on uh, either Apple Store or Google Play. And I will continue about Zohrot. Um, Zohrot, as I said, is the only organization dedicating, dedicated with working within Israeli society towards recognition and taking responsibility and redress to the crime of the Nakba um, and support for the right to return and a free democratic space in which all inhabitants and returnees could live in dignity. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the work we do uh, within our communities with our Israeli brothers and sisters uh, to change hearts and minds and eventually to change the situation that we, we are in. Um, I want to talk about how to say Nakba in Hebrew uh, and how to say Auda, return in Hebrew. Um, how Zohrot made something that was unknown, uh, taboo, undiscussed, forbidden, um, known, and made the term Nakba a part of the Hebrew langu language. And by that, uh, made a disruption in the language itself and changed it a bit um, and gave the opportunity to those of us uh, born and raised in a settler colonial society to come to term with the true nature of where we live at uh, and hope to decolonize it. Um, and uh, starting with decolonizing our own minds. Uh, so that is the work that we try uh, to do within Israeli society and the mission that we try to complete. And that's starting with our own stories because we are of course also part of the stories. Uh, and my own story is uh, I have been the director of Zohrot for about a month, about a year, sorry. It passed really fast. Um, but long before that, I was just a uh, very average, very ma mainstream Israeli girl, uh, born and raised in a Zionist family under the uh, blue and white flag. And in many ways, I am still that person, no longer with the same convictions, but these are my roots and this is where I'm coming from and all the work I do, I do as an Israeli Jewish woman. Um, I was born in the 70s Israel, where definitely we didn't know what Nakba is. We have never heard of it. I was raised, raised in a small religious community. 
uh, near the South Ka coast, about 35 kilometers from the Gaza Street. Um, and that kibbutz I was raised at called Yavne is between the sites of the displaced villages of Bashit, Sukrer, and Barake, uh, all of whose inhabitants uh, were displaced in 1948 between January and May, and most of them and their descendants now live in the Gaza Street uh, under Israeli closure. A few remains of those villages uh, can still be seen today, and they are a part of the landscape of my, of my childhood, uh, but really not so. Because you see, I'm telling you these ba very basic facts uh, as if I've always known them, when in fact I knew absolutely nothing at all about those villages until my university years. Um, I didn't know they ever existed or the circumstances of their depopulation and destruction. Um, I would walk or bike through uh, cotton fields or go to the beach with my friends um, near uh, Ashdod, Isdud, another depopulated town. Um, I had my first cigarette in what we called a khirbe, a deserted house. <coughs> Um, that I was brought to believe uh, was an ancient remain, um, testament of the antiquity of this land and our belonging to it, uh, when in fact uh, it was of course a Palestinian house from the first uh, part of the 20th century, um, and people still lived there when migrant parents came from Europe as settler colonials. Uh, to, um, to settle in this land, and my own father, as a young boy, actually witnessed uh, some of the deportations of his Palestinian neighbors. Um, and again, I didn't know any of that, and I was foolish to not know that uh, for such a long time, but I was definitely not alone. Uh, most Israelis born in the decades after the Nakba I know next to nothing about it, about a mass ethnic cl cleansing and destruction of a whole culture and society um, that took place on our behalf. Um, and that's a destruction that archaeologists now claim is the most uh, widespread and complete in all the male layers of uh, history and archaeology. Uh, that can be found in, uh, in Palestine. Uh, school textbooks in Israel never mention it. Uh, it is not discussed uh, in families. It's kind of a taboo subject that you're not supposed to talk about lest it shakes your whole being, uh, and it really does. Um, so for me, as I started reading in university about what I then thought of as the war of independence from a Palestinian point of view, um, it has been a slow and often painful uh, process of discovery of the facts, of the truth, of rediscovering my childhood landscape and my own identity uh, with, with everything that my was missing from it or deliberately erased from it. Um, and rethinking my own personal history. Uh, a lot of, work of the work we do at Zohot is to try to facilitate this process uh, for, uh, for more people, creating opportunity for participants to look at the landscape uh, that is often as familiar as the back of our hand uh, and understand that they don't know it at all, that there is something missing from it and come to terms with that and ask yourself, okay, so what can I do about it? Uh, Zohrot as an organization didn't exist yet when I was growing up, um, and neither was the internet uh, in, um, used in a way that it is today as an online resource. Um, and again, I didn't hear anything from almost anyone with uh, one exception of a teacher in high school that gave me a story uh, in Hebrew called Chir Bet Chiza to read. Um, when I was in the 12th grade. And that's a story by the Israeli writer Yizar Smilansky who fought the 48th war and right after that in 1949 uh, wrote a novel about uh, fictional Kirbat Chize 
uh, that is similar to uh, Palestinian villages he actually participated in, um, in destroying and depopulating. Um, I'm not sure why that teacher uh, gave me that novel to read. Um, and when I asked her about that, uh, she, she just said, you know, uh, the war was just, but there were some atrocities that we need to acknowledge. And that's what many Israelis think until today. Uh, I'm forever thankful to her, however, for uh, seeding the, a seed that will take many, many years, too many years uh, to grow. It didn't grow immediately. Um, uh, it raised some uneasiness inside me, but not enough uh, for me to not to refuse to serve the army like a good, obedient Israeli girl uh, I went. And I only went as far as I refuse any uh, army course or army involvement and just wear the uniform and do nothing for two years. Um, but that <laughs> that all I could do or, or I did at, uh, at the time and uh, it will take me many, many years to, uh, to come to the point of uh, acknowledging the Nakba or even knowing what it is. Um, so when I was asking other people around me throughout the years um, about what was here before and what happened here, I ran into this wall of silence, like you are not supposed to talk about this. Um, and the Chot was founded in 2002 uh, by a group of Israelis, mostly Israelis, uh, who were active in peace organizations before and in dialogue groups for many, many years. And they gradually came to the understanding um, that the taboo and silence that uh, I just told you about um, are an hindrance um, to all of their peace and dialogue efforts because uh, uh, those efforts completely ignore the Nakba as the pivotal point uh, in Israeli and Palestinian relationship uh, and as the root of the conflict. Um, so uh, ignoring that prevents uh, peace dialogue and human rights efforts by Israelis from being effective at all. Um, they started a group that was called then Nakba in Hebrew uh, to initiate activities uh, to commemorate uh, the Palestinian Nakba, commemorate destroyed villages, and this group north to become a uh, Zohot. Uh, memory is a political tool, a very powerful one, a cultural tool, tool too. Um, and as probably you know, many Jewish traditions uh, are, consist of commemoration rites, uh, including our new year that is called in the Bible the Day of Commemoration. Uh, in Israel, the importance of memory to Jewish tradition was co-opted uh, into Zionist society and uh, in used in, in many ways to indoctrinate us into Zionist thinking. Uh, one example is uh, the Day of Commemoration for Fallen Soldiers that is always the day before Independence Day. Uh, as you might know, and that uh, instilled in us since childhood a strong connection between soldier sacrifice, between the army, and the existence of the state that we are brought to believe is our own personal existence as well. Uh, Zohot also uses memory as a powerful political and cultural tool, uh, but we try to offer a different form of memory. Um, which is why the name Zohrot in Hebrew means uh, remembering in the female form. Um, a memory that's not patriarchal, not, not militaristic, uh, most importantly not selective, but inclusive. Uh, that calls for not for defensiveness and aggression um, as lessons of the past, but for accountability, redress, and reconciliation. Um, a memory in the tradition of a feminist movement uh, that put first uh, oral history that uh, calls for believing uh, the survivors and uh, prefer their testimonies over the uh, written official history written by the conquerors. Uh, so this is why we are called Zohrot. And by the way, every um, Independence Day Eve, we hold uh, 
either commemoration or some discussion um, that um, again is meant to be kind of a disruption to the celebration that are everywhere in Israel um, and create something that is a resistance to this um, celebration of ethnic cleansing. Um, and also to uh, create a space for people uh, to come and do something else on that day uh, and commemorate in a different way. Um, so in 2002, Zohot was funded and um, embarked on an enormous task of mapping villages, uh, towns and cities, taking testimonies from Nakba survivors, uh, posting signs in sites of destroyed villages, and cross-referencing works of uh, scholars like Salman Abusita, like Benny Morris, uh, to make available concise information about each depopulated Palestinian locality. The number of people that live there, uh, the day of its destruction, and the Israeli settlement, uh, parks, army bases, or other facilities uh, that are built on their ruins. Um, Facts and testimonies from 65 villages, about 10% uh, of the whole, were published in booklets in Hebrew and Arabic, uh, and information about all 610 local known localities uh, can be found on our website and on the iNakba app, as I said. Um, please download it, it's really great. Um, this accumulated to one of the most uh, extensive resources anywhere, and certainly the most extensive in Hebrew uh, about the Nakba. Um, it means that today, girls like the one I used to be, running into that same wall of silence, uh, have a much better information source uh, to build on or and to learn the truth from that they are not taught at school. It means that, unlike before, most Israelis know what Nakba is today. It has indeed become part of the Hebrew language. Um, and I just wanted to mention that in this and all other endeavors, uh, Palestinian citizens of, uh, of the Arba uh, of the 48 uh, borders were instrumental. Um, they did a lot of the research, a lot of the gathering of testimonies, um, and also are um, constant uh, participants in, in dialogue and in pushing us uh, towards uh, more political awareness. Uh, there were many of them. I would like to mention two. One in Jirias, who has been in the court since the beginning. She's one of the founders and still volunteers with us now that she lives in Pittsburgh. And Umar El Gubari, who my colleague, the director of our Space of Return program, and a crew facilitator of dialogue. Um, this work that I mentioned did put the term Nakba into the Hebrew language. Um, but what uh, Zohrot and all of us found out in the process, um, this was only the first step. Uh, knowledge and accessible information does not necessarily translate um, into uh, acknowledgement or willingness for political, cha uh, political change. Uh, I had a chat uh, not very long ago with Norma Mursi, who was also one of the founders of Zohrot, and she told me, I think we were a bit naive at the beginning. We thought the problem was lack of information. And it turned out it was just part of the problem. Um, and now that people know what Nakba is, uh, we have a maybe more difficult task uh, of uh, redressing the Nakba or offering, discussing redress and offering ways to redress the Nakba, uh, which in our view, of course, redress of the Nakba would mean right to return and actual return of the refugees as the logical uh, outcome if you recognize the Nakba as a crime against humanity, uh, which you should. Um, realizing that we in fact live in a colonial society and a regime based on separation and racist hierarchies, um, that this is what Zionism means, it's not easy for Israelis and a lot of them are not willing 
uh, to go the whole way. Uh, so there would be a lot of different responses um, to, to this conversation. Um, some will just not consider the Nakba as a crime at all, uh, but we will not talk about them. Um, <laughs> we would talk maybe about uh, people who would maybe uh, say, yes, it was a crime, maybe we'll even be uh, willing to uh, offer compensation, uh, definitely think uh, the Nakba should be commemorated officially in Israel. But um, uh, saying, yeah, well, we, we still want our Jewish state. Um, we are not willing for five million or six million refugees uh, to come back. That's not feasible. Uh, that's not possible. Uh, that will um, mean the end of the Jewish state, which uh, they're, I guess, right about that. Um, so the, the process should be um, convincing people, um, and that's very difficult to do in Israel, uh, to separate between the regime, which is uh, Zionism, colonialism, the Jewish state, and themselves and uh, their own personal rights or collective rights uh, to live uh, where they are, where, where they were born, and how they can fit in um, in a future of return. And that convince them that this future um, is actually a very hopeful scenario for them too, and it unfolds in it. Um, uh, real possibility for a much better future uh, than the present that we have now. Um, can I show a video? Sorry. Um, so I just want to show you, oh. Okay. Um, so, this is a film that we screened uh, actually on uh, Israeli Independence Day. Um, and it concludes a process of uh, tours and uh, research in uh, some uh, destroyed Palestinian villages in the area of Bechemish, sou south of Jerusalem, uh, during uh, 2018, uh, where, um, when a group of Israelis learned about uh, the history of these villages and tried to think um, what return could actually look like uh, in this specific area. Uh, it's part of our of efforts to talk about practicalities of return, look at it is as concrete terms as possible um, and see how it can be done and what uh, it will entail. Um, thank you. Yes. <laughs> mm. 
ולאט לאט אנחנו מתקרבים איפה שהיה מרכז הכפר והחלק הצפוף יותר של הכפר. ערימות האבנים פה זה חלק מבתים וגם מהצד השני של השביל ולאט לאט אנחנו מתקרבים איפה שהיה מרכז הכפר והחלק הצפוף יותר של הכפר. פה אפילו אתם רואים פתח של באר, כמעט כל בית לידו היה בור מים או באר מים שאנשים חצבו. מבחינת היהודים הישראלים להכיר את ההיסטוריה שלהם, את, ה... את ההיסטוריה של האדמה הזאת. כי כרגע המצב שבו זה כבר היסטוריה מחוקה, היא לא, היא לא מצוינת על פני השטח, ועכשיו עוד רוצים לבנות עליה ובכלל לקבור אותה. ההסתכלות שלנו אמורה... אוקיי, זה רק דבר מאוד קטן של מה שאנחנו עושים בטורס, ואני רק אעבור קצת קצת. הכפר שלהם מחדש. די, זה זכותם המלאה. אני מרגישה קורבן של הציונים. באיזשהו מקום ששיקרו לי, שלא סיפרו לי את האמת, אני קורבן של השיטה. הייתי צריכה לפתוח את העיניים לבד ולספר את הסיפור לעצמי מחדש ולמצוא את האמת. אני בעצמי. כלומר, ברור לי שאני עכשיו בצד, אחרי שגיליתי את האמת, אז הייתי קורבן של השיטה, ועכשיו אני לוקחת אחריות ואומרת, אוקיי. כן, מה? אני מבין מה ש... אוקיי. So, um... This bit uh, may be a bit uneasy to watch. I know it makes me uneasy. Um, I, I want to tell that woman, you, you are not the victim here, really. Um, and I could have chosen something else. I chose this uh, to try to show you a little bit of the process uh, that uh, people go through uh, when they come and participate in a Zohrot uh, activity. Um, yeah, they're uh, dealing with the past and present and a realization. Uh, that you are not a part of an inspiring story of nation building, but part of a settler colonial society. Uh, and that me and my family are personally responsible to a variety of despicable crimes. Um, that realization can crush someone or it can sprung and motivate someone into action. Uh, for many, it leaves them guilt-ridden, also isolated, sometimes from their immediate environment, from their families, um, lonely in the workplaces, etc. Um, and this may not be very conducive to political action. So the importance of an organization like Zohrot is in its ability to um, expose Israel to this inconvenient truth, um, but maybe even more so in its ability to create a space and ways for them to do something about it, uh, to turn guilt into activism. Uh, so this is actually what we try to do. And it goes through conversations like that, that in our last tour that we did 10 days ago, um, latest tour, sorry, not last. Um, uh, there was one participant who was uh, a psychiatrist and he told us about uh, a term called uh, spaces of embarrassment or spaces of dissonance and he said that exactly what is happening in our activities, maybe what is happening here right now as well. Um, uh, but from these spaces, if you know how to handle them and if you uh, give people some time to think, uh, can grow something very, very significant. Um, so we try uh, to tell people that yes, you are a part of a colonial society and of an on ongoing crime against humanity, but you don't have to be. 
you can also be a part of a struggle for justice and for a more hopeful future. Um, Zohot has always supported the right of return from the beginning, but the focus uh, throughout the first decade uh, was more on uh, commemoration and acknowledgement of the Nakba. Uh, maybe it uh, took time uh, to evolve, to be more, uh, more bold in uh, our conversation with, with Israeli society. Um, because talking about actual returns seemed and maybe still seem uh, so far removed from day-to-day -day reality. Uh, but once the first building block is put and uh, the information is out there, you can't ignore it anymore. Uh, and as I said, the logical next step is to support the right of return as a redress uh, for the Nakba. Um, Okay, um, I, uh, you of course know uh, about Palestinian refugees. Uh, they still have no solution and no state. Most still live in refugee camps. And the third and fourth generation still hold on to the right to return. So uh, it's a basic uh, obligation of any Israeli of conscience to, uh, to support uh, this, uh, this demand. Um, it's a scary thought for many Israelis though. Uh, the thought of return means the end of the Jewish state, um, which they would understand of the end of security, uh, a threat to their own personal existence. And we try to offer a different thought. Can you think of your existence as one free of the need to oppress other people? Can you exist in a society without racial hierarchies? Uh, does your Jewish identity really depend on the negation of Palestinian identity? These are the questions that we ask. Um, so we learned how to say Nakba in Hebrew, and now we're learning how to say Auda, return, in Hebrew. Um, we need to talk about return as a basic, non-negotiable human rights, of course, but also uh, as a hopeful prospect, prospect for everyone who lives in this land, including Jewish Israeli. Um, it's a challenging conversation, and the way we do it is using uh, imagination. If I said uh, memory was a powerful political tool, imagination is too, even more powerful sometimes. Um, and again, we look at the Zionist society, uh, the uh, Zionist movement that uh, in a very big time a uh, very big way used imagination as uh, a political tool to tell the world uh, a very powerful story fails, but nonetheless powerful of uh, people returning to their homeland after uh, centuries of being persecuted um, and, uh, and exiled. Um, a land without people to a people with no land, as the Zionist slogan goes. Uh, and to convince anyone of this, uh, to be persuaded that the land is empty, um, you have to look at the current, then current inhabitants of the land and not see them as real people. So there was a very strong dehumanization from the start of Zionism and still goes on today in Israel in a very, very big way. Um, not really seeing Palestinians uh, as fully human who deserve uh, the rights, and it is used still to prevent return and to deny uh, basic rights. Uh, to counter this, part of, the, of what we do, especially in our education program, uh, and we produce curriculums for schools and educators to use, um, is um, showing Palestinian culture, history from a Palestinian point of view, uh, Palestinian literature, Palestinian works of art, um, and the history of Palestinian resistance um, as, as a way of uh, showing this as a whole people, uh, whole culture, uh, humanize it in a way uh, to students who learned um, almost from childhood to dehumanize the same people. Uh, the same thing happened in our annual film festival uh, that is called 48 millimeters, uh, films from Nakba to Return. It shows in a very central place in uh, Tel Aviv Cinematheque every year in December. Um, and it uh, shows among um, 
other works by international and Israeli filmmakers, a lot of Palestinian cinema. Um, again, seen for Israelis, seeing the, the story from a Palestinian eyes is a very, very important, sometimes life-changing experience. And the screening of films like that, that uh, are never screened in Israel, except by us, um, again, uh, creates a disruption uh, in, in space, in society, and creates something um, different than what we are always taught. Um, and that is uh, when everybody in Israel is uh, live in, uh, in fear and anger and don't see any uh, hopeful future. Even our friends in the activist left are mainly preoccupied in um, pointing out, uh, maybe resisting um, uh, current atrocities, uh, uh, protesting them, etc., uh, but with um, very little clear vision of um, how to change this reality or even what they want this change to be, um, to present return as a hopeful future for everyone is an act of radical optimism. Um, and Zohrot is one of uh, very few Israeli institutions uh, that actually look further into the future and think in a, a coherent political program that can change this land. Um, the tours like the ones you, uh, you just saw a bit of um, are very central to the Hort's work. Um, we go to uh, destroy depopulated villages, towns, neighborhoods inside cities. Um, and the reason is because, of course, touring um, and, and being in the places is the best way to actually comprehend uh, what the Nakba is uh, seen remains, seen places where nothing remained at all. Um, and it can also be an active play of imagination, seeing what's there now, who is living there now, uh, knowing who is living in the refugee camps, and try to think, can this um, destroyed space become a space for return? Um, and can their uh, arrangement be made for an actual return? And what will it entail? What will have to happen? What will we have to work on? Um, and how to bring it about? Um, also, we, we use tours uh, for another reason, that um, touring the land, which is a biblical term, um, is very central to Zionist indoctrination as well. Most of us are being told uh, since childhood to uh, go travel in our, our own land um, and, that, and to conquer it through the fit. It sounds ridiculous, but I heard this term many, many times. Um, teaching that through walking the landscape and getting to know it, um, it become yours, which is a bit subversive, I think, because it implies unintentionally that is, it isn't really yours. Yeah. Uh, but, that <laughs> but that besides the point. Um, so, uh, so as a result of that, Israel has a fairly developed uh, outdoor um, uh, culture, and we actually build on that and make disruption in that culture when we do these tours. And we take people sometimes to places they know very, very well. And uh, then they see that they actually don't know them at all, like I didn't know the place where I grew up. Um, the um, tour we did 10 days ago, um, it went through five large parks uh, in the center of the country between Jerusalem or and Tel Aviv, uh, parks planted by the Jewish National Fund, Kakal. Uh, over the ruins of dozens of Palestinian villages. And as we walked and drove uh, through this land, you, you can really uh, see uh, uh, almost complete ethnic lenses in, in that part of the country. And um, one of the participants told me, well, I know these roads and trails very well, but I will never be able to look at them the same way again. Um, so this is uh, what we're trying to do. And as you can't, uh, you can't look at this place the same way uh, again, 
uh, what do you do? What, what can you do with that? Um, so that is a very good question. And um, what we try to do is, as I said, create disruptions um, as much as we can. We call it sometimes go through the cracks. Our curriculum in history, literature, uh, and history of the Nakba is called cracks. Uh, identify the crack, go through it, push it as hard as you can to widen it, um, and to find ways to um, to integrate. Uh, for example, works by uh, Rasan Kanfani or by uh, Mahmoud Darwish into the uh, Israeli curriculum, and we have a network of about 400 teachers who would, uh, Israeli teachers, uh, in Jewish Israeli schools that would take these materials, uh, sometimes all of them, sometimes part of them, and find ways, even though we are not allowed ourselves to go into schools, unfortunately. Um, but teachers will uh, come and do training with us and will take materials and will find ways uh, to teach it. Um, tactics can be uh, creative in many ways. They can be more confrontational, uh, like a protest like the one we did this year uh, in front of the Ministry of Defense in support of the Gaza Great Return March and call for, uh, uh, for return. It was, I think, the first uh, demonstration for the right to return in many, many years in Israel by Israelis. Um, but sometimes they can be less confrontational or uh, a bit more um, uh, roundabout, like uh, our gatherings uh, on the eve of Independence Day. Um, and this year we showed this film that I just showed you uh, a bit of, and we had a discussion about return with two members of the, of the new Knesset um, that was just elected then and is being elected again tomorrow. Um, but so it, it creates a uh, space for people to uh, uh, to come and participate and uh, do something else than the celebration outside, but uh, it also creates disruption, but we are not satisfied with that. Uh, we do inward communal work, but also outward work. And what we did uh, this year, we usually do some direct action on the eve of Independence Day. Uh, this year, uh, a group of activists uh, went uh, outside to the streets of Tel Aviv that were very celebratory and very loud. This is how it is on Independence Day, fireworks and all the rest of it, loud music. And they stood near the uh, village of Sumail, what le what's left of it now in center Tel Aviv, um, and uh, used a projector uh, and a uh, very simple bed sheet that uh, activists wore on themselves uh, to screen a short film in a loop that showed uh, footage from the Nakba and footage from the Great Return March in Gaza uh, and ended it with the question, so what will happen now? Um, it was not immediately clear to passers-by uh, what is going on here. We weren't demonstrating with Palestinian flags or anything. They were just see, I don't know, some crazy people doing something, and they were curious what is going on here. And in this uh, state of mind of curiosity, we see a crack that uh, we, we can enter and we can start a conversation. Um, so we had some leaflets ready to, um, to hand to them. We had some facts about the Nakba to tell them, uh, and we tried to engage just passers by who were celebrating Independence Day in conversation about what this independence uh, really mean. Um, we don't usually expect people uh, to be convinced um, instantly, that rarely happens. Uh, but I, I think we take, uh, they take something with them just as I took something with me that uh, took me more than 10 years uh, to, to reach where I am today, and it's still a process of uh, continue to learn. Um, this work is necessary in Israeli society, and it's actually a work to, to correct this society. Um, if uh, people, a lot of the time, even in my own family, ask me, why do you care about Palestinians more than you do about your own people? And uh, the answer is, I really don't. 
uh, I, uh, I care about my own community and I want it to be uh, just and fair and equal and not colonial and racist. Uh, so this is my motivation to do that. Um, this work has to be done locally. Of course, Palestinians are doing their struggle everywhere in the West Bank, in Gaza, um, in refugee camps, uh, in the US and other countries. Um, a lot of uh, international organizations and activists are doing an amazing job of advocacy uh, for, uh, for Palestinian, Palestinian rights and Palestinian return. Um, and our part of the puzzle is to do the work within Israeli society and uh, to um, turn it into a society that can join justice and not abstract it. Um, so our tools are uh, for talking Auda in Hebrew, apart from knowledge and the language of human rights, our imagination, memory, curiosity, uh, empowering people of conscience to turn their guilt and fears into activism, and radical optimism. Uh, to give more coherent uh, ideological framework to this ongoing activism, Zohot gathered over the past two years a group of Israeli intellectuals and activists uh, supportive of the right to return to draft a document uh, we call Return Vision uh, that aims at envisioning how return could be brought about, what its realization would entail, and what, was, uh, what are the different phases that will be needed. Uh, you can read the whole thing on our website in uh, uh, Arabic, Hebrew, or English. And I just want to read a short paragraph and I will finish with that. Um, we members of the council are fully aware of the need uh, to overcome barriers within Jewish-Israeli society in order to break the taboo against pub publicly discussing the return. This is part of our accountability as Israelis, on the one hand, and part of the need to make amends and redress the ongoing injustice against the Palestinian people. We see a future in which the land will be transformed following the refugees' return, transformed from the better. We envision a regime change that will allow a democratic society grounded in equality and freedom a multicultural society that will express and acknowledge our Middle Eastern cultural origins and enable us to integrate in the region. This integration will also include the Jewish identity when it is lo no longer Zionist and racist. We do not want to be occupiers, master, or colonialists, never again. We want to live in this land as equals. We therefore undertake to our utmost, to do our, our utmost, to reach out to our public, to call for acknowledgement of the Nakba, of our responsibility to the uprooting of most of the Palestinian people from their homeland, to recognize the right of return, uh, redress the injustice and do that justice for the sake of a life of peace and true partnership for all the inhabitants and returnees of the land. Uh, so this is our vision. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very compelling presentation. My name is Saeed Eric I'm a Palestinian journalist. I write for an East Jerusalem-based uh, newspaper. I'm struck by what you said about knowledge is not acknowledgement. And, and that, that's very, very profound. And we can see it. I mean, we see uh, how Israelis serve day after day in the occupied territories, um, brutalizing Palestinians. I mean, every Israeli between the age of 20 and 70 has done this at one point or another, so they know. And uh, the claim that they do not know, we don't know, is of course uh, a false claim. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my question to you goes to the heart of your work. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what do you do about bringing this? I mean, how, where is your target? Uh, where do you work? How, how do you go about engendering support? Which communities? Are they in Israel? Are they among the Palestinian Israelis? Uh, are there activists in the West Bank that you mm -hmm. reach out to? Uh, are there uh, some uh, in America, mm -hmm. for instance, some of the birthright groups and so on are now mm -hmm. beginning to say that to take back a second look? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, our target audience is uh, definitely Jewish Israelis. 
uh, not Palestinians, uh, not in 48 or the West Bank, although they sometimes come to activities. Uh, usually there are some Palestinians uh, participating, but uh, we, we don't aim to educate Palestinians about the Nakba, <laughs> of course, but, but I Israelis. Yeah, um, so uh, a lot of uh, people come to us out of curiosity and they stay as uh, supporters and activists, uh, do their own thing or work with us. Um, I, I, we, we get a lot of support from uh, Palestinians, Palestinian organizations in the West Bank, abroad, uh, the Jerusalem Fund here as well, uh, because I think, um, a lot of Palestinians I know, at least, uh, understand the importance of uh, doing this work inside Israeli society. Um, Israeli society are millions of people that will eventually have to be part of the, uh, of the solution. Uh, so someone have to, to do the work there. And of course, we cannot expect uh, Palestinians uh, to do that, but we have to expect uh, ourselves, Israelis, uh, to do this work because these are our communities and we are responsible uh, for them. Uh, we reach out to communities everywhere in the country, uh, Israeli communities. We initiate uh, workshops and courses for teachers, for example, for some specific target groups like planners we invite them to uh, come and, and plan an imagined return to a specific place and uh, do a whole workshop on that. That's one of our activities to filmmakers. And uh, we have uh, already a quite a lot of uh, short films that uh, were made with our help by Israelis or Palestinians who want to talk on the subject of Nakba in return. Uh, and to the general public, people who just want to, to learn, and there are a lot of people especially young people, uh, curious and at least willing to learn. We try uh, to reach out to uh, people in high school before they go to the army. Uh, to be quite honest, it's usually too late. <laughs> uh, although for uh, some, some teachers and uh, school principals are doing a great job uh, trying to counter the, the propaganda that uh, um, that young Israelis are being fed uh, before their army service. Uh, so we, we have a lot of ways to reach out, uh, especially producing interesting, compelling materials um, to, to bring people to be interested. It's after all the place they live in, and we tell them facts about it and truth about it that um, a lot of people want to hear. They will not necessarily always agree, uh, not immediately, um, but they will think about it. Uh, we work with other human rights organizations in both Israel and the West Bank uh, and try to make uh, bigger coalitions in support of return. Thank you. Um, first of all, just a comment. Um, listening to you, it makes me think so much of what we've been going through in the last couple months on the 400th anniversary of the first slaves in, in what is now the United States and all the issues that we're having with white nationalism and stuff. It, I mean, the parallels could be a whole nother session. Um, what I was really interested in, because I first heard about Zikro when I first visited Israel and Palestine in 2007, um, was I think at that time, and I don't know whether it's still the same, that a huge proportion of the land where all the villages were ethnically cleansed and are ruins are still basically public lands are open because they're part of the, um, the national forests, mm -hmm. they're part of the closed military areas. Yeah. And then when you mentioned just a minute ago, just briefly, and I'd like to hear more, you discuss more, when you got together um, both Israeli and Palestinian and other architects and planners and land use people and people who lived in these villages to actually plan how you would rebuild them mm -hmm. to make it really concrete. Um, have you 
been able to share that information with the larger public so people can get away from fearing these hordes are going to come back and push me out to see how it actually is something that can happen concretely, really mm -hmm. on the ground. Here are some plans. This is what it would look like. This is how many mm -hmm. people would be. These are, are the things that you would have access to in stores and whatever um, if we started rebuilding these villages for people to return? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question, and that's actually what we, uh, a lot of what we do is uh, try to dismantle that fear of, uh, yeah, that horde is coming by actually talking as concretely as possible uh, about return. And uh, that film that we just saw uh, two minutes of, it's a 20 minutes film that you can see on our website, and uh, that actually one of the, of the group that was researching that area and trying to uh, envision return to that area. Um, but um, there are a lot of villages there. They focused on four villages. Uh, some of the sites of the villages are empty still, some are not. There is an estimation that 81% of the uh, Palestinian land still uh, is still not populated uh, now. It's a little bit outdated. Uh, so you know, there has been a lot of development since, so um, maybe it's a bit less, but yeah, still a lot of the Palestinian villages are, are um, buried uh, under JNF forests and nature reserve that were actually planted there uh, to eliminate the, the remains of the villages and to prevent return. So it's only fair that return will happen there. Uh, in some other places, uh, Israeli settlements were built uh, in the site of Palestinian villages, and uh, it um, thinking actual return um, brings a lot of tough questions. It uh, it will not be easy to do, but yes, we think it's uh, completely possible. There can be arrangements made, made, um, and the principle we try to think of return according to is uh, that people should come back to where their families were exiled from, to their specific village or town or city uh, where they hail from. Um, and in instances that this is not possible, they uh, should be allowed to return as uh, close to there as possible. Um, or come instead of, uh, of Israeli settlers that maybe will have to move and be compensated. There can be different arrangements, uh, but um, the principle is to, you don't correct justice by, um, by doing another injustice, and that this land is wide enough for everyone. There is room definitely for everyone. It will have to take, of course, political goodwill and an enormous effort. But um, when you start thinking about it in concrete terms, okay, I look at this uh, Western Galilee or the, you know, uh, or the Southern Shore or whatever, um, does it have room for uh, new Palestinian villages here? Yes, absolutely. Uh, can Palestinians integrate in existing cities? Absolutely, yes. It's uh, w w when you think about it in these terms, it's it's completely possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a two-part question, mm -hmm. uh, and the first part concerns uh, the attitudes of Jewish Israeli youth, uh, which are said to be more intolerant than that of their uh, parents. Uh, is this true, and what does it mean? Uh, and secondly, what kind of threats do you get, and does it require you to take security precautions? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not a researcher of Israel society, but yes, that there are uh, some surveys that shows that uh, Israeli youth are uh, going to the right. It's all the more reason uh, to double our efforts. Um, we get threats sometimes. We don't take security. Um, the um, authorities sometimes try to cancel our uh, events, uh, influence other institutions not to work with us, and uh, individual right-wing activists sometimes try to threat us, but we're used to it. 
and you know it's um, it's a small price to pay. Palestinians pay a much much higher price for any resistance that that they put. So um, it's very basic obligation to do that. And uh, as Israeli Jews, we still have quite a wide um, uh, rights in in that land and um, uh, and freedom of speech, etc. I don't know for how long, but. But we do, and we have to make use of it as much as we can. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering, in your um, organization's theory of kind of anti-colonial resistance, what are the accountability mechanisms that you have within Palestinian society? And then simultaneously, what work is being done to dismantle the racial hierarchy within Israel? And do you see that as, um, part and parcel of your work in the anti-colonial struggle in much the same way that other settler colonies have been unable to truly rectify with things like anti-blackness and mm -hmm. other forms of racial hierarchies in attempts uh, to push forward an anti-colonial agenda? Um, yeah, we definitely work on um, uh, addressing uh, racial hierarchies within Israeli society and we see uh, return as an opportunity to, to open these files and to create a non-hierarchical society. Um, and uh, in fact, much of the uh, racial hierarchies in Israel societies are created because of the hatred of Palestinians, of Arabs. Uh, it also means that Arab Jews were robbed of their Arabness. They have to choose between being Jewish and being Arabs. Uh, and, and are taught to, to hate their Arab origins, and uh, this have to be changed, and it can be changed, and this is just another reason why a return can be a very hopeful scenario for many Israelis as well. Thank you. So your app tracks the depopulated villages, and you've said that on a practical level, it would be better for refugees to return as close to their original homes as possible. Um, I have some friends and myself who are very concerned with the attacks on UNRWA that were in the news cycle for maybe three weeks last year, and we've all kind of forgotten about it. Because UNRWA has the family files, right? It has records of where the refugees came from specifically. Um, does your organization actually have those kinds of files to not just what town is where and what village it used to be, but also things like who owned the specific house? Like, for example, I know Ali Abunima's house is specifically like a mile west of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. kids smoke weed there. Like, yeah. Do you have those kinds of records? Uh, no, we, we don't have records on that. We, we have some records in some houses, but uh, nothing systematic. Um, the, the principle of uh, people uh, need, to, need to, if they want to, of course, it's not obligatory, but it's their right to return to where they were exiled from. Uh, as you know, Palestinian identity is very localized. Uh, people uh, have different attachments to uh, Jaffa or, uh, or Jerusalem or the Galilee, etc. Um, so this is part of the deal, uh, but we, we don't have these records yet. Of course, they will have uh, to, uh, to be acquired if return happens, but we are not at that stage at this point. Thank you again. Um, I know that uh, Zokrot was working several years ago with Badil, mm -hmm. and you we all still do. Yes. Good. Uh, and that was actually the first time, um, I think, when you all were here together on a, a speaking tour mm -hmm. that I actually heard about people in visualizing uh, return, which was awesome. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. I wonder if you could also talk a little bit about actually what kind of numbers you reach. How many tours do you do a year? How many people, you know, so we can get sort of an mm -hmm. idea of the scope of, of what, um, what's happening. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. So uh, with Badil, actually, um, that film that you can uh, see on our website is part of a um, um, collaboration with the Badil sort of collaboration that uh, we did with the Israeli groups. Badil um, dealt with the same area with a Palestinian youth group, uh, groups who were trying to envision return from their side, what would happen. Of course, there's a lot of work there to do, as you know. There's this uh, dream of return to some idyllic past. Of course, this is not how it's going to happen, and this is the very important work that uh, Badil is doing about practicalities of return on the Palestinian side. 
Uh, what was the next question? I'm sorry. Forgot. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, we do 40 to 50 tours a year, uh, some open to, to the public, uh, some for specific groups, uh, Israelis or foreign. Uh, there are, on average, I guess, uh, 40 people on each tour. Uh, we reach about 400 teachers. Um, the film festival has something like 1,500 viewers, uh, a lot more than that. Uh, um, people who uh, reach out through the website or the app, that's uh, tens of thousands of people. Um, so yeah, direct participants in, um, in our activities, maybe a few thousands every year and indirect participants is much more than that. Um, thank you for being here. I'm a filmmaker um, from Gaza. Um, your work is appreciated. And um, to me, you sound like very radical. Um, <laughs> um, so you said about um, like tactics and um, you know confront confrontational disruptions um, and you even used radical optimism. So, you know, you, you refer to Israel in a very radical terms, and um, as we know that Israel was founded on terrorism. So, as a Palestinian from Gaza, and all my friends now on the border, and my family is, um, you know, calling for their rights. Uh, we're, I'm from a refugee camp in Gaza. So, uh, as an Israeli citizen, knowing your society, that I know nothing about except it's a military society. Um, how do you see the role of Palestinians in claiming their own rights of return? Armed struggle, um, marching, firing missile, um, and um, have you considered of um, calculating some reparations because as we Palestinians, we always talk about the right of return and reparations at the same time, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I think reparation will definitely have uh, to be part of any future uh, solution. And um, I don't think I'm very radical, <laughs> by the way. I think reality is really radical and, and has to be changed uh, from the roots, which is uh, what radical means, of course. Um, but I think I'm quite moderate, actually. Um, it, it just seems like common sense to me that people c would be allowed to, to return if atrocities were done uh, against them. Um, I, of course, support uh, any form of Palestinian resistance. Uh, it's not for me to say which one they should take. I, and I'm, I'm not an advisor on this, why I, I support Palestinian resistance. very much. Uh, all of the activities that you have outlined uh, seem to be either public relations minded or cultural. Do you engage in any political activity, for example? Uh, did you take a role at all in campaigning against uh, Bibi Netanyahu? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we are less active in the political arena, that's true. Um, we um, we see um, work within the society, we're a grassroots organization, uh, we, we see it as maybe more effective, um, but uh, we are starting to, um, to work with uh, members of Knesset who are willing to listen, uh, they are mostly the Palestinian members of Knesset, uh, but not, not all. Um, I don't think campaigning against uh, Netanyahu is uh, something that we are very interested at because we are interested in changing the regime itself and not that prime minister or this one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things that <coughs> I saw, <coughs> I noticed in the video and another thing that I've seen is that those ruins of Palestinian villages are really very beautiful and very picturesque. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy 
for American Jews who come over to Palestine to say, to be convinced that this is some kind of ancient Hebrew monument. So I was wondering if there was any sort of branch of Zichron, Zichron up here in the U.S. that was working to convince American Jews who bring a lot of the money in and convince the government to bring even more in that these beautiful villages are not, in fact, in fact, ancient monuments, but recently depopulated and ethnically cleansed Palestinian towns, that Israeli Jews, that the IDF depopulated. And the second question was, in terms of your declaration about return that you formulated, mm -hmm. what feedback have you gotten from Palestinian groups and individuals about that? Mm -hmm. What have been their criticisms and views? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I think the work of uh, um, American Jewish communities or commun uh, Jewish communities everywhere is massively important for this. As you said, this is where the money comes from. Um, and JVP in the U.S. are doing a uh, very important work exactly on these issues. Uh, and they actually have uh, also a, a curriculum uh, called Facing the Nakba that they push in, in Jewish schools that is based of, on our curriculum. So uh, we cooperate with them a lot, with other organizations in other countries, and they have very important role uh, to play. Um, what was the second question? What sort of feedback oh, right. Mm. Well, um, a lot of the feedback was very positive. Uh, from Badil, for example, from um, um, other activists. Uh, I read that declaration in May during the annual uh, March of Return that uh, 48 Palestinians are holding every year on, on Israeli Independence Day. Um, and they're not all responses were positive, <laughs> to tell the truth. Um, yeah, some people come and say, well, you, you, you took our land and now you say return, yeah, just go away, <laughs> you know, which is valid, of course, um, as, um, as, as a feeling, obviously. Um, and, and we're open to hear that. Um, but uh, we, uh, we think um, uh, realistically, uh, six or seven million Jewish Israelis are not going to just disappear, and they will have to be part of the solution and will have to be decolonized. Um, so there is a work to be done in, the, in this society, and, and a lot of Palestinians support it. As, uh, as I said, the Palestinians have always been part of Zohrot and uh, responsible for a lot of the work that is being done. Well, uh, unfortunately, we have time for one more question. Yeah, you mentioned before that uh, the younger people are, move, uh, the younger Israelis are moving to the right. Uh, are, aren't there also a lot of younger Israelis who have moved to the left and moved out? Moved out of the country, yes. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of the movement to the right is really because younger people are leaving. Um, no, I think it's because of indoctrination. Uh, what? Indoctrination mostly. Um, it's uh, because the crisis of the second intifada that uh, people kind of lost uh, any faith of any peace process. Um, and But look, there are uh, many contradicting undercurrents. As uh, a general rule, yeah, it's true that uh, society is moving to the right and uh, uh, of course there's a lot of work of uh, incitement and, and uh, spewing hatred that is put into this, it doesn't just happen. Um, but uh, there is an undercurrent of people moving to the left, people who were what we call Zionist left, uh, pro two-state solution, etc., and have um, learned about the Nakba and, and are now um, not Zionist or anti-Zionist or in a process um, of um, getting awakened from their Zionism. So th this also happens. There are um, a, a lot of different undercurrents. Does it answer your question? Yeah, I, I would say that I, I have two young relatives who moved out of Israel, and I assume mm. that they were part of the movement. 
Um, yeah, th there are people as individuals moving out for um, for many different reasons, political reasons as well. Yeah, that also happens. I don't think it's huge numbers, but uh, really, it's not it's not my area, and I I don't know. Rachel, thank you so much for your presentation and for all the work that you do. Uh, we're honored to have you here, so thank you so much. Thank you so much. The honor is mine. Thank you all. Thank you.